Despite what people think today, the books of the Bible were not written at one time by one author and sealed with a stamp of approval before being added to the biblical canon. Especially when it comes to the Hebrew Bible, most books are a collection of different oral traditions or sayings that later scribes collected and assembled together. When most Christians hear this, it sends shivers down their spine and implies the biblical text cannot be reliable. But is this really the proper reaction? Or is it another example of misunderstanding the cultural context? When people picture how Paul wrote his epistles, this image tends to pop up in their minds. Paul retires to his private study, sits at his desk, and writes his letter before mailing it out. All with his trusty sword behind him, apparently. But this image cannot be further from the truth. Ancient people didn't write like we do. For one, no one really used a desk. That was an innovation that came much later. And ancient authors actually did very little writing, but instead dictated to a scribe who wrote on the floor or on their lap. See, ancient languages didn't utilize spaces, punctuation, or lowercase letters. Ancient Hebrew didn't even have vowels. These were public languages. Brent Sandy says, In written communication that was intended for oral communication, what an author wrote was shaped in significant ways for a public reading. In other words, you were meant to read these documents out loud, to sound out everything, to know what was being said. Likewise, that was typically how documents were written, dictated out loud for a scribe to copy down, then read out loud instead of one reading quietly in your head, like today. For example, it is a well-known fact that the highly educated Cicero wrote through scribes, like his servant Tyro. Seneca warned of speaking too fast, so that a scribe could copy down all that one says. Of the 15 surviving Bar Kochba letters, no two contain the same handwriting, implying the use of different scribes. Paul Actemeyer said, Dictation was recommended over writing in one's own hand by Dio Christostom, and famous personages, we are told, were regularly accompanied by a slave prepared at any time to take dictation, whether on horseback, in chariot or sedan chair, or at leisure in the baths. Julius Caesar was famous for his ability to keep multiple secretaries simultaneously occupied as he dictated successively portions of individual letters to each of them. Likewise, this is what we see in the New Testament. Specifically, the epistles not only mention scribes, but sometimes other authors. Romans 16.12 notes the scribe Paul dictated to. It reads, I, Tertius, who wrote you this letter, greet you in the Lord. Peter notes that his first epistle was written with the help of Silas. Many of Paul's letters open with mentioning the co-authors. First and second Thessalonians Note the letters were composed by Paul, Silas, and Timothy, not just Paul alone. 2 Corinthians, Colossians, and Philippians were written by Paul and Timothy. And Galatians mentions an untold amount of contributors who were there with Paul. Now you may think, yeah, but surely Peter wrote most of his letters, as did Paul, with the others contributing very little. But that might not be the case. This is an instance of imposing our cultural norms on an ancient collectivist culture. Scribes could contribute more than just writing what was dictated and could add their own structure and wording to specific passages. Cicero was the most outspoken about this in the ancient world. Many times he mentions he would dictate letters to scribes, but many times he also notes scribal input and changes, like how Tyro would make editorial corrections and improvements. So scribes could operate merely as a stenographer and just copy verbatim what they hear, but they could also function as an editor and make improvements or reword something. But they could also go even further than that. Cicero informs us that his brother Quintus would have scribes write entire letters, and Quintus would then review and sign off on them. Cicero also notes twice in his own life that due to times of distress, he gave others full power to write in his name and to do whatever they think is fit. So it is not inconceivable that something similar 
could have happened while Paul or another apostle was in prison, and they could have asked a scribe to write a letter for them and only provide a rough outline of what needs to be said, and the scribe would do the rest. Lincoln Blumel says, Paul could have verbally dictated certain letters to a scribe by either spelling out exactly what he wanted in a given letter or by merely providing the scribe with a general outline to follow. Or he could have provided the scribe with a written rough draft that was to be subsequently polished into a final draft to be sent. Such differences among the Pauline letters do not necessarily imply that they were not authored by Paul. In most cases, an individual scribe could imprint a distinct literary style on any document he or she wrote, which would greatly affect its form, vocabulary, and perhaps even content. This may seem strange to us because we tend to be more of an individualistic culture where most books tend to have one author. If Paul simply gave an outline to a scribe and didn't actually dictate, how could he be the author? But the ancient world didn't view this as an issue. Books or letters, for the most part, tended to be a communal effort and could be written by an entirely different person and yet still bear the name of an authority figure behind the letter. So for example, because Tertius felt free to sign off at the end of Romans, it could mean he was given a degree of liberty to add his own elements and flavor to Romans as well. Richard and O'Brien write, It is more likely that the letters were composed with the co-authors actively contributing. Paul's missionary endeavors were a team effort. This is more than just a bit of trivia. Scholars have debated for centuries whether all the letters attributed to Paul in the New Testament were actually written by him. Many will argue that Paul couldn't have written certain letters because they don't have Pauline characteristics. That is, they don't sound like Paul. But if Paul regularly worked with co-authors and secretaries, if they actively contributed content and turns of phrase, then this might explain why Paul's letters have variations in style. They bear the mark of his partners. Some might object that there are places where we see Paul saying he was writing with his own hand. But in reality, this only strengthens the case Paul wrote mostly through a scribe. In the ancient world, a scribe would typically write the bulk of the document, and then the author would write something we would consider a postscript in their own hand as a way of signing off on the document. For example, we have found Greek letters from Egypt where the main body was penned by a professional, and then the postscript or signature at the end was written by someone else. Paul probably wrote in his own hand the closing remarks of his letters, and at times would explicitly mention he was writing by his own hand, but this was not always necessary to explicitly state. Despite what we think, this is probably the case as well when it comes to the Gospels. The Muratorian fragment recounts where some of the books of the Bible came from. Specifically when it comes to the Gospel of John, it notes there were other Christians with him, specifically Andrew, that probably contributed to the overall book. The fourth of the Gospels is that of John, one of the disciples. To his fellow disciples and bishops, who had been urging him to write, he said, Fast with me from today to three days, and what will be revealed to each one, let us tell it to one another. In the same night it was revealed to Andrew, one of the apostles, that John should write down all things in his own name, while all of them should review it. Now when it comes to the books of the Old Testament, things get even more complicated, because books were probably edited and added to over several generations, and there is no doubt scribes played an intricate role in how sacred books were composed. Very few people could read or write in the ancient world, as it was considered a special task that only scribes were expected to know, as well as some of the elite. But if you were rich, you could learn to read and write, but it wasn't expected or necessary, as the custom was just to hire a scribe to work through. Austin Greeley says of Egypt, Very few people in ancient Egypt knew how to read or write. People who learned how to read and write were called scribes. Likewise in Israel, Jeremiah worked through a scribe Baruch, and scribes are mentioned throughout the Hebrew scriptures as well. Most, if not all of the Hebrew scriptures, were probably dictated to scribes, who added to and updated certain texts over time. For example, the book of Jeremiah, as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Septuagint, 
is one seventh shorter and arranged slightly differently than what we find in the Masoretic version. So it is probably the case that the version most Christians carry around is an updated version with additional commentary by a later scribe. Now when most Christians hear this, it can both bother and shock them, but I don't think this creates any theological issues. Michael Heiser explains using an analogy. Uh, the Bible bears lots of marks of editorial work, okay, more than one hand. And that, that would freak people out until I gave them the holy stapler illustration. I do not believe in the holy stapler. You say, what's the holy stapler, Mike? Well, imagine yourself as the, you know, one of the followers of the prophet Ezekiel. And, or Isaiah, I mean, pick any prophet you like. And you're one of his followers. So what do you do every day? You get up, and if it's Ezekiel, the first thing you ask yourself is, is he going to do anything weird today? Like, is he going to wear clothes today or not? You know? So if you're, if, you're, if you're with somebody normal, <laughs> you'd probably ask, is he going to go out and preach today? So you go out, you go listen to Isaiah preach, and that was a pretty good sermon. You're getting this down, you know, so maybe, maybe you're writing some of it down, maybe you're just storing it away in your memory, maybe you're going to write it down when you get back, but eventually... A lot of what this guy is preaching gets written either by himself or somebody else. It's called the school of the prophets is the Old Testament term. Okay, they produced scripture. Let's say Isaiah kicks the bucket. Now what do you do? Hey, you know, the master's dead. What do we do? Hey, do you, you know, what? okay, here's what we do. You get all your stuff together, everything you wrote down, all the sermons and everything. We got to collect it. Because we know it's from God, we've got to hand it to posterity. We've, we've got to get it together so it's not lost. So everybody brings their notes. And now what does the leader do now? Okay, put them on a pile right here. Got all the scrolls here or whatever on a pile. He shuffles them, makes sure the sides are even, and says, Anybody got a stapler? It's ridiculous. You know what he says? Is anybody here really good at writing? Do we have a good editor here? because it has to make sense when it's done. We have to fashion it into a book. It's still his stuff, but we've got to make it into a beautiful, coherent, readable thing because we care about it. We're not just going to go ka-chunk, oh, I'll add that to the pile. Put that in the Ark of the Covenant, that ought to go good. You know, it, it, that's just not how books are made. It's never how books are made. Okay? Has, that's part of the process of inspiration. If you believe God was in the process, okay, why is that so earth-shattering to have more than one hand? So just because scribes contributed to the text, that doesn't mean they are unreliable. We just have to acknowledge and understand what is taking place. In fact, I would argue this makes the biblical text more trustworthy because it means that each book wasn't just put together by one person, but a community working together to make sure the theological views and stories were written down and articulated properly. John Walton suggests the best way to understand how the Hebrew scriptures were created is through a system of authorities, trade-ins, and scribes. Authorities would be something like a king, or in terms of the biblical text, someone like Moses or Isaiah. They generate information for the community, like revelations, decrees, rulings, or teachings. Working with authorities would be tradents. These are people who perpetuate and preserve traditions, but they also help give them shape, form, and articulate ideas properly through the generations. Scribes, of course, were the ones who wrote down the information that was passed on and could rearrange things to flow better and provide structure and corrections. You could think of it through a modern analogy of how school children are taught science children are rarely taught directly by scientists, the authority figures. Instead, publishing houses craft books designed for children. They take the work of the authorities in science, preserve and articulate the information for children. Then they hire authors to write down what the book should contain. The information we find in a children's science book goes back to an actual scientist, the authority behind the work. Even though several editors and authors work to preserve and articulate the information properly. This is similar to how the books of the Old Testament were put together. There is an authority behind each book of the Bible, but the final product 
was a community effort. This also helps us to realize how documents were updated over time. Languages are not static and evolve over time. We may be able to read a document from 300 years ago, but we would struggle with an English document from 600 years ago, and a document from 900 years ago would be unreadable. The same logic applies in the ancient world, although languages back then did not evolve as fast. Abraham did not speak Hebrew. Moses probably spoke a proto-Canaanite form of Hebrew. A Jew living in Babylon, using an entirely different alphabet, would not be able to read a document Moses wrote, let alone understand the language of Abraham. So as expected, biblical texts would need to be updated over time. With that, a community of scribes and tradents could update texts over time so they could still be used by the community, and this would be expected. But they could also add new commentary to clarify each teaching so that the current population could understand the message properly. Mark Smith notes that sometimes scribes would take expressions in an international language and translate them into their own local idioms so the community could better understand the message. This might be what happened with the book of Jeremiah and how one form is one seven shorter. Later tradents and scribes may have seen fit to add commentary for the later Jewish community so they could better understand the book and what was being taught. The authority figure, Jeremiah, is still behind the text, just like there are still scientists behind a textbook, even though authors and editors provide commentary so a student can better understand what the scientist is trying to teach. Now within the biblical text, some passages do contain very archaic language and possibly show affinity to a much earlier time period. But these tend to be the poems or passages that contain a poetic structure, like the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. These are the types of passages that you would expect to retain the archaic language, much like how today modern hymns retain their linguistic structure. Imagine people from 2000 years in the future find a transcript of a church service from today. Within it is the sermon, written in present day English, but also the lyrics for the songs that were sung during worship. And we see they sang, Be Thou My Vision, God Is Able, Amazing Grace, and 10,000 Reasons. The future historians would be able to indicate that two of these songs are from earlier time periods. Which makes sense because even though we do not speak the earlier form of English used when these songs were written, we still do not update the songs because they would lose their beautiful poetic structure but the sermon would be written in modern English. Likewise, when we look at the biblical text, we see that the narratives do reflect late Iron Age Hebrew, but some of the Psalms and poems can reflect an earlier time period. Necessary parts are updated so the community can understand the narratives, laws, and teachings, but the poems we would expect to retain their archaic forms. So with this understood, it doesn't mean the biblical texts are unreliable, just because the language is late. Scribes and tradents looked at themselves as preservers of traditions, not artists able to craft whatever they wanted. Their role was to preserve the message of the authority figure, and be sure it was articulated properly. The language used to articulate the message was expected to be updated in order to preserve the message, as John Walton says. They were not tampering with authority, because authority continued to reside in the authority figure who inaugurated the tradition and in the tradition that had been transmitted by the tradents in the community. This is why scholars like Richard Hess and Kenneth Kitchen are still able to find indications in the books that claim to take place in earlier times that they are reliable, even though the language of these texts is very late. Hess notes many of the names and customs in Genesis and Exodus fit with the second millennium BC or older. Kitchen notes several correlations in Genesis that align with their respected time periods. Just because the language was updated, that doesn't automatically mean that is when the accounts were first written. That would be like saying the King James Bible must have been first crafted and written in the 1600s because that is the language it reflects. Obviously it is just a translation of an ancient canon, and that is probably what happened during the Babylonian exile, when the documents were updated and translated into the Chaldean alphabet. So once we understand how ancient documents were crafted 
we can see there is no reason to fret over the fact that documents were constructed by a community at large and updated over time. We cannot impose our modern expectations for book publishing on ancient collectivist cultures. And just because their language was updated over time, that doesn't give us reason to doubt biblical reliability.